Well, we uh, survived the Thanksgiving holiday. Bob was up here in New York, <laughs> and uh, Mom almost ruined the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that rubber, what was that that we got caught in the oven? Well, we had no stuffing. That's the bottom line. Um, yes. But overall, I'd say uh, it was a pretty successful holiday. Well, you know what? In defense of my mother, it's my understanding that she wasn't the only cook in the kitchen, and it was your kitchen, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I think half the blame falls on you, brother. The sous chef does not get blamed, only the chef. But I got to say, you know, getting through the Thanksgiving weekend, um, as we go to the end of the year here, man, oh man, like, it's been a pretty good year, guys. I mean, that's the market up about 20% with dividends reinvested. Um, you look at net worth at an all-time record high. You look at wages at an all-time record high. Earnings are an all-time record high. I mean, it's definitely a time to be grateful. Well, it's time to be grateful, but you know, first of all, the stock market's not at all-time record high. Um, matter of fact, several of my clients have pointed out to me we haven't been to the highs, you know, since almost two years now. Um, we're actually about five percent below those highs. So it's, I think it's good news for us as investors is that the market isn't at an all-time high, but earnings are, and earnings estimates put it at an even higher high. So. Looking forward to this rally continuing, guys. Bob, I like your uh, your optimism right into the year end here. You know, you're not uh, not changing course at all. I respect that. Well, you know, with all this volatility, it doesn't feel right, right? It doesn't feel like we're doing well. It's kind of like your favorite football team. You know, you know who mine is, but you know they're winning, but they're winning ugly, right? There's it hasn't been a comfortable game for anybody. It always comes down to the last second, uh, last field goal, last pass. Uh, and our portfolios are winning ugly this year. You know, you have the S and P's up twenty. Of course, it was down twenty last year. So if you're only an S and P investor, all you did is make zero income. All you made some dividends. You didn't make any return. But uh, a lot of things are moving higher right now. Well, you know what? That I really like your uh, you're you're talking about the the Philadelphia Eagles. For those of you who are curious, who Bob's favorite football team is, they do win ugly. And I, I think it's out of spite. I think you know Philadelphians by nature are a spiteful group of people. And you know, I would also the same extension goes to the stock market. You know, the stock market's been spiteful all year. You know, we did great <laughs> up until August and then interest rates went up and then, you know, the stuff hit the fan and now things are starting to pick back up again. Yeah. You know, it's, it's got a lot of our clients, at least my clients I know, uh, you know, really wrapped around the axle about what's going to happen next. Well, I got to tell you guys, this bull market is the real deal, right? I mean, you think about it, it really did bottom a year ago, October. We had a great rally into August, like you said, Chris. We had a classic, right? A classic textbook. 10% correction. And um, as we speak, most of that correction has been wiped out. Yeah, but I get the frustration. I mean, if you look at the S&P 500, it hit its all-time high two years ago, two Novembers ago, in fact. So, you know, I, I understand where investors feel like, wow, the market's been up, it's been down, but it's really just been sideways for like 24 months. And for investors, that's a long time not to make money. Um, and, I, and I get that, but you know, Bob, I always like to go back to your old saying, never sell out of a dull market. Now, I don't know if it's a dull market, but a market going nowhere eventually does break out and typically does break to the upside. So, uh, you know, the patient here, I think, are who are rewarded in this situation because it's hard to stay invested. You know, you're hearing it's apocalypse now. We're going into recession and markets are up, they're down, they're up, they're down, but they're not really going anywhere. But this is the time you have to be vigilant, right? This is the time you have to stay invested because... The patient here are always rewarded. Well, you know, guys, you only say the old saying is there's only two guarantees in life, right? Death and taxes. Well, there's two things, two factors that impact the markets always, and that's energy and interest rates. And the big thing that's happened since uh, the last 30 days is oils dropped dramatically, right? We're everybody's talking about hundred dollar oil. All of a sudden, we're now pushing down on seventy dollar oil. And when oil goes down, it's a tax cut for every individual, every company in the country and in the world, right? So, you know, that has a major bullish impact. And then interest rates impact everything. And we went from this scary 5.2% 10 year treasury on its way to seven hair on fire analysts every day telling us that, uh, you know, inflation's out of control, rates are going up. Suddenly, that 5.2 turned into 4.3. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's huge percentage wise. The other thing too is like, you know, and you made this point on our fireside chat a few weeks ago is that if it, when interest rates do go down, you know, we're already, you know, hitting record earnings here. So if rates do go down, that's just going to make companies all the more profitable. Yeah. There's one thing we've been pounding the table about for weeks is lock in to longer term bonds. You know, yields are at a 16 year high. This is the time to get locked in. And just like that, like to your point, Bob, we went from over 5% 
to now under 4.4% as we're recording this, that is a huge move. And that's a big opportunity lost, which always goes back to like one of the great maxims uh, in our investment philosophy anyway, is the darkest hour is always before the dawn. It really is with investing. Because man of mine, you go back about a month ago, uh, right around Halloween, people were not feeling real optimistic. And now all of a sudden, it's just like everything's changed on a dime. But really, like we said last week, nothing's really changed. <laughs> nothing's really changed. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting is, you know, all of a sudden you have the uh, president of China hanging out the uh, olive branch, right? He's real friendly all of a sudden. He wants to send the pandas back that he just took away from us. Somehow, <laughs> you know, China suddenly needs a friend now that their real estate market's imploding. Their stock market's down 50%, you know, from its highs. Um, China, the Chinese are suddenly being friendly. Um, I would, I'd be a little, I'd be a little suspect of that olive branch, guys. Well, you know what they say: desperation's a stinky cologne. <laughs> but you know, and I smell it from China, Chris, right now. <laughs> but there's there's another surprise that can be in the positive. I mean, China's had a big slowdown; um, it hasn't really rebounded the way a lot of us anticipated. Hence, Bob, oil prices are so low right now because global economic activity is not picked up the way it has here in the U.S. But you know, really, at some point, a surprise in the positive is you know China could start getting back into the groove. Um, you know, they're still the second largest economy in the world. They're going to have the biggest middle class in the world, even though it's an aging population. You still can't discount China. You know, they have a huge impact on the global economy. And at some point, I suspect here they will get out of the doldrums. And that's going to be good for everybody because everybody trades with China, no matter what they tell you. Um, and that's a lot of consumers that everyone benefits from. So I, I think at some point here, that's probably going to be more of a catalyst than a headwind as it is right now. Well, you know, Rai, you've been speaking to the immaculate disinflation that's been happening. Um, you know, just look at a chart of the CPI or the PCE. And if, you know, you don't have to be an expert reading charts to see that the trend is your friend and it's heading lower. Uh, but a lot of that has to be, you know, China slowing down and they're exporting their de deflation. You know, they're exporting their slow growth, you know, to the rest of the world because they still, you know, manufacture a lot, you know, and it's, um, I speak to a lot of clients who manufacture in China and they're trying to move away from China, but, you know, you can't move away from those highly trained workers, right? Nobody in the world has as many trained, educated workers as China does. Well, Chris, being the patriot he is, he reassure everything if he could, um, True. but, <laughs> you know, but reassuring yeah, my, my new trend. iPhone's going to be made by Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden it doesn't work that well, but no, I mean, the reassuring definitely is a trend. I mean, Bob, you and I have been reading that Elon Musk book, which is awesome. Um, and just you read about just all the automation and the ability to actually manufacture in the US. And he basically took an industry, the auto industry, uh, one of the hardest industries to get in the game with, uh, where everything is basically delegated across the globe and brought it all home to the US and really proved that you can actually manufacture in the US again. And with automation, artificial intelligence, there's going to be so many things we do in the US more productively now. And you look at the manufacturing infrastructure that went in place last year, it was like something like 500 billion, some crazy number. Um, so, you know, money is flown into the US for manufacturing, productivity gains that we're going to see over the course of the next couple of years because of automation and the ability to do things at home that we couldn't do before bodes really, really well for the economy. You know, I'm, I'm also reading that book too about Elon Musk. And there's a, there's a part where it talks about how at one point sleeping and living on the factory floor. And, uh, you know, I, I've taken a page out of his book. You'll notice I'm back in the office again. I've actually moved in. <laughs> so you should see productivity of paying capital management go up substantially in the next well, 12 months. If you months. remember, Chris, when I first opened that office, there's a washer and dryer right to your left. Uh, so yeah, you can, and you know, I can, I have that cut in the back for you. So I expect to, I expect to see some 24 seven production out of you. The yeah, very least it's my year. It sounds like Ryan's taking a vacation for the full year next year. And, uh, everything should be, uh, in perfect order when I get back. So I'm excited. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, I did, I did appreciate that book. If I, I have a newfound respect for Elon Musk, um, because I mean, the guy's always in the press, but you know, I like his cars. I like his, I like his style. I like the fact that he works hard. He takes a lot of risk. But I wouldn't touch Tesla stock with a 10 foot pole. I mean, it's still <laughs> selling at 79 times earnings. And, um, you know, there are a lot of great car companies out there manufacturing cars. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing electric Porsches, electric BMWs, electric Mercedes, and the Chinese are coming too. I think they're going to be the largest car manufacturer in the world. Uh, the way things are going over in China. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and it, that's, again, there's, there's plenty of opportunity, but I think it also brings another good point up 
we talked about a lot about interest rates and interest rates look like they probably are coming down next year or the Fed's going to cut next year. The odds are like 50% by May. It's an election year. Call me a cynic, but I think the Federal Reserve might be a political position. But hey, you know, that's not for this podcast. But if rates do come down and we already saw rates come down a lot over the course of the last couple of weeks, you're starting to see the rally broaden out. It's not just the Magnificent Seven, you know, companies like Tesla, NVIDIA, but financials are up like 10% in two weeks. Real estate investment trusts are up like 10% in two weeks. So lower rates have impact a lot of different industries. Small caps and mid caps have been outperforming large caps for the last two weeks. So, you know, it's a good opportunity to really broaden out your exposure because the rest of the market is relatively cheap and lower interest rates have a very positive impact on earnings for a lot of companies. So right now, if you miss the big move up in the Magnificent Seven, there's plenty of places to put your money. It's not too late, but you want to be proactive, not reactive, because the way we look at things right now, things look pretty good. And, you know, markets don't settle down, as Bob likes to say, they settle up. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 141, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence on your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. But if you have over a million dollars and you want some more handholding with your financial planning, you can sign up for our free Total Financial Master Plan, where we'll do a full financial analysis at no cost. We literally will go as far as building you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial picture. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front and we'll just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's planning an income plan for retirement, how to draw from your portfolio, how to factor in inflation, how to take social security, we'll put together a full dynamic income plan. We'll show you how to diversify your money. Make sure you're properly diversified. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last couple of years because markets have been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and tie it to your goals. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a full free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. So Bob and Chris, you know what our firm, Pain Capital Management, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. We think a lot about financial planning. In fact, it's pretty much all we think about. And, you know, it really doesn't pay, uh, we've learned over the years, to take shortcuts when putting together your plan. And I thought we could talk about areas where maybe you kind of just brush over it when you're trying to figure out your own financial independence plan and why that's actually a really bad idea. Well, I'll take the first one. Um, Taking too much risk to make up for savings that you didn't do in your early years. Uh, And I I look at this as like the problem here is threefold. One, you know, when you take too much risk, you're invariably not only having a more aggressive portfolio, but you're also not well diversified. So, you know, when you have those, you know, disjointness in the market, that takes away your opportunity to rebalance. Whereas, you know, when you're consistently saving throughout your life, you know, essentially you're, you know, you're adding when the market dips, you're adding when the market goes up. You know, when you take too much risk, there's no opportunity to do that. And then the last thing is, is that, you know, it, it's, it's hope is a tactic, right? So you're, you're hoping that by taking more risk, that's going to make up for your savings. But the reality is, you know, when you take too much risk, you don't diversify, you know, ends up shooting in the foot. Well, you know, Chris, how many times over the last 15 years have we had new clients be on board and, you know, they're, they, they buy into our strategy. We, we set it up, you know, based on planning. Um, and while we're doing the initial consultation, it turns out they have somewhere like a million or $2 million in tax loss carry forwards uh, because they were huge risk takers. And then as soon as something goes wrong, like we have a correction like we did, you know, this summer for three months, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't want this conservative strategy. We've got to do something different. We've got to buy structured products or we got to start writing calls. We got to, you know, buy futures or sell, sell, uh, you know, the futures market. Um, so it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of an emotional response. I think when you take more risk, it's, it's, it's that, um, it's, it's when there's a lack of planning, there's a lack of knowledge about what you need to do. And so you're always hunting for the next, next big thing, I think. 
Well, it's true, Dad. And, you know, it's kind of the ironic part about that. You said that people like to jump into alternative investment products. The irony of that is that they're typically more risky <laughs> yeah. and more expensive. Much well, more expensive. Yeah. I think that's one of the good rules of thumb. I think this is a Bobism is you end up actually getting less return, taking more risk. You know, it's one of the, the, the actual dirty secrets of this industry is that a lot of times you get all the volatility and sometimes you get all the upside, but then bam, when things go against you, you lose it all and it's just too hard to make back. You know, it's that paradox of return. If you go down 50%, you have to go up 100% to get even again. So ironically, a less volatile, more conservative portfolio a lot of times, most of the time ends up outperforming the more risky portfolio. Well, that's, and that's really the rub, right? Um, and one of the reasons why I think we've been successful is because I made all those mistakes, you know, early, right? My my first clients paid the tuition so we could be as good at investing as we are, <laughs> you know, because, you you know, in every bull market, you get this democratization of the market. All of a sudden it becomes easy, right? Back in, in 99, it became easy. All you had to do is buy tech stocks um, and then they crashed and just had to buy the bottom and they rallied up and then you didn't make any money for 20 years, right? Same thing's happening now, right? We had the uh, Magnificent Seven had a huge crash last year. Then they had a big bounce back to now. And it's like, oh, I just have to buy them. I don't need to invest in diversified portfolios. It's going to end ugly. It always does. Yeah. And I think the other part is like just not even understanding what you're being invested in, right? I mean, a lot of, we always say products are sold. They're not bought. Um, and we see this all the time when we look at annuities or some of these structured products that became very popular in the last two years because the market's been sideways. Mm -hmm. So it's to get all the upside of the market, none of the downside, which first off, when it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Um, you know, a lot of these products are terrible products when you start breaking down how they actually work. Um, and most people just hear the very simple pitch of like, oh, well, I get all the upside, none of the downside, when really that's not true. And number two, there's so many pitfalls of those type of investments. In fact, you know, I did an analysis recently on a couple of those structured products and it was like, oh my God, you start going through that prospectus, it ain't pretty. No, it, it's kind of like an annuity, the same thing. The complexity is so extreme. You doubt the salesperson understands it. Um, but I've been training your nephew, you know, your two-year-old nephew, um, you know, to work for a brokerage firm because all he has to say is AI, uh, dot com, internet, you know, <laughs> uh, software. And it's, uh, it's real easy, you know, to sell what's hot, right? <laughs> and it's a you know it was amazing when the when the uh, tech stocks really rallied hard last summer. I suddenly got a lot of calls about you know what's what's up with this AI. We got to get heavier invested in AI. And then when you had the correction, no, not a mention of AI. And and the thing is with with our artificial intelligence, every company is a tech company. Every company is going to benefit from advancements in technology, just like we did with the internet. Yeah, it's like take the most old school manufacturing company. Well, they're using automation sure. and artificial intelligence in their factories, right? So it, it really is. It, it's it, it's going to be ubiquitous with every company. And this is why you want to have a diversified portfolio because it's not just about companies that produce AI. It's about all the companies that are going to benefit from it. And that's going to be one of the biggest trends of this decade, Bob, to your point. It's just like what happened in the 2000s with the internet. It just exponentially changed everyone's businesses from a, an efficiency standpoint. And I think about like going to your office back in the 90s <laughs> with the fax machine, having to look up Morningstar books to look up yeah. the mutual funds, whereas all that stuff now is done in a snap of a finger. It's just incredible how technology continually changes things and increases productivity. Rumor has that's how Ryan still does it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but think about how we tortured you, Chris. When, you, know, you, had, you had to manually update the software upgrades and, you know, you were the only one that understood how to work a computer and everybody was calling you all the time. And now it's all done automatically. It's so seamless. And, you know, technology becomes commodity. It's a commoditized business, just like anything else. Well, you know, the other thing too is, I mean, there's another reason it's not an excuse to get financially organized, right? Like we yep. have a portal that we use where you can literally put all of your different accounts in one place. You can view it in one place. It updates the values every single day. So right now, I mean, the biggest mistakes we see is you have accounts everywhere. You have a 401k over here. You have an old 401k over there. You have an IRA with a brokerage. Uh, you have a savings account with a bank and none of it is working together. And you don't really have a clear tally up of what you have. But now with technology, it's easier than ever to put everything in one place. And we know how powerful that is from a financial planning perspective. 
to be financially organized and be able to have a bird's eye view of everything you have in one place. And most of us don't do that. You have to ask yourself, do you know where your money is? Yes. Do you know what you own? And do you know why you own it? Which is even more important. And it makes it so simple for us in terms of, you know, giving perspective and planning and making decisions because there are a lot of things that are out there that are still uncertain, right? We have an estate tax that's going to change pretty dramatically, right? That you know, sunset provision coming up in 2026. Healthcare is still, you know, going up more than inflation. Um, there's a good article in the journal today called the magic pill, right? Now people just take this weight loss pill. So they don't have to worry about their health anymore. Um, all of a sudden, you know, cause two thirds of the country's obese guys. I couldn't believe that statistic. Um, and of course, you know, what's the biggest cause of death, right? Heart disease, right? Not, yeah. you know, not, not being invested in properly, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you got to take care of yourself, but you also have to, you know, make sure that you plan properly for those expenses. Well, I, I hear it is in regards to that. They're going to nominate mom, the new director of national health. <laughs> America will be drinking smoothies in no time. Well, that, that's a problem too. In, in the U S it's kind of like, okay, well you could exercise, eat healthier and get in good shape, but you can take a pill. Ozempic. Yeah. And I think it's the same philosophy sometimes that comes with your financial planning. It's, we want this simple one size fits all approach and it doesn't really work. And I think that's what a lot of these firms offer. Like everything needs to be more custom tailored. You know, I think a good financial plan, planner is like more like a, it's like a financial trainer, right? It's like keeping you accountable, making sure that you're uh, eating your, your lettuce and not the chocolate cake um, so you get the long-term results. And I think it is the same type of thing that we see all the time with a lot of these products and the way that you just have a collection of investments as opposed to a real plan. And the difference is night and day and the success to becoming financially independent and putting yourself in the right place. We want you to know what you own. We want you to know why you own it. And if you want to go off the reservation and speculate on something, we let you, right? We let you go and open up your own account, what you call, right, the cowboy account. And it's always amazing when it comes time to raise funds for certain of my clients. I always say, well, let's go raid that cowboy account. And they said, well, no, it's actually, it's it's way down. I can't sell anything yet. <laughs> and it's, it's like it never dawns on people that just because you speculate doesn't mean you're going to be right. You know, you get lucky every once in a while. Uh, slow and steady wins the race, in my opinion. You know, so you want to be the tortoise, not the hare. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, a Pew Research survey in 2014 found that about half the respondents had no idea who headed the U.S. Central Bank. While only a quarter could correctly name the Fed head, Janet Yellen at the time, who is now the Treasury Secretary. Some 17% said the central bank was still chaired by Alan Greenspan, whose tenure had ended about eight years earlier. I guess the American public is just not that interested in uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing. Hey, let's, let's face it, guys. There's, there, there are a lot more charismatic individuals <laughs> in society than Federal Reserve chairmen or chairwomen. Um, of course, if you listen to our podcast, you all know about Jerome Powell because we talk about him all the time. But uh, I'm not finding it very shocking, Rye, that most people don't know who's ahead of the Federal Reserve. Well, we certainly know Bob is. One of our clients once claimed that Bob had a picture of Jerome Powell on his desk. My, he's on my wall of fame. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Bring it home for Jerome. He, uh, <laughs> as long as he engineers a soft landing. All right, Chris. <laughs> Turkey contains tryptophan, which promotes good sleep and a good mood. According to Healthline.com. Tryptophan is one of several essential amino acids, which are considered the building blocks of proteins in animals and plants. Specifically, tryptophan is involved in the production of serotonin, a hormone that helps regulate mood, and melatonin, a hormone that helps to regulate your sleep cycle. Sounds like you need to eat more turkey. I didn't know how that so many health benefits. Well, it was shocking to me. You know, a sibling that I won't name often shames me during Thanksgiving because I don't like to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. But I'll tell you what, the days following Thanksgiving... I eat more turkey sandwiches than anybody alive. Wow. Love that trip to Finn. Love that turkey. It's so good. There you go. I think it's a real American uh, delicacy. I think, do we have like the most turkeys in the world in North America? I think that's a correct stat, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me I on I think it was cases of wild turkey. I could be wrong about that. <laughs> yes. Wild turkey. Exactly. And Bob's a wild turkey, as we know. Bob, Tesla's share price is below what it had been when it first joined the S&P 500 in late 2020. The S&P 500 had a total return of 27.02% from the time Tesla joined the index through November 15th. But because Tesla doesn't pay a dividend, its return was only a mere 4.82%. So for all the hype about Tesla doing well this year, 
it's actually well off its high when it joined the S&P 500 at this point. Wow, that's like three years ago. I know, it's amazing. And not only does it not pay a dividend, half the return from the stock market over your lifetime comes from dividends. So there's strike one. Strike two, never overpay for a stock just because it's going to an index. There's so many people that had to invest, so many institutions that had to buy the stock because it was becoming part of the index. Always best to buy the company they're kicking out of the index, not the one they're putting in. It's like when they kicked Exxon out of the Dow a couple of years ago, right before the big turn in energy. So yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. So buyer beware. Um, all right, gentlemen. Well, great show. If you like our podcast, you love our podcast, episode 141, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Let people know how great our podcast is. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.